Future progress in modern biology and medicine faces some astronomical hurdles. But first, let's all sit back, relax, and have a sip of coffee. Now, the active ingredient in coffee that keeps us chugging along, keeps us awake, is caffeine. Now, caffeine is a moderately sized molecule made up of a number of different atoms. It's more complex than water. But simpler than, say, DNA or proteins. Well, let's say we wanted to fully describe just this caffeine molecule. For example, to understand its internal energies, its structure and interactions, to get a sense of how these atoms are working together to make caffeine what it is and how it stimulates us. Well, just the complexity involved with this caffeine molecule is beyond the capability of being simulated by. Any computer today, and in fact, beyond any computer ever possibly made with current technology. Why? Well, even if you were to take a computer chip, start packing in more and more transistors, and make this computer chip really, really big, and equal to the number of atoms that make up our planet, that wouldn't be enough. Even if you kept going. And made this equal in to the number of atoms that make up our solar system. That wouldn't be enough. And if even if you kept on going, made this computer chip equal in size to the number of atoms that make up our entire Milky Way galaxy, you'd still fall short of just simulating that caffeine molecule. Now think about that. Your average cup of joe, beyond galaxial computing scope. So then, what does that say about more complicated and complex molecules and compounds, ones that are actually important for biological science and for battling diseases? Molecules like DNA or viruses, proteins and enzymes. As great as our computers are today, there is a wall. There is a fundamental limitation of our ability. To simulate and understand the detailed structures, interactions of these important and crucial, biologically relevant molecules and compounds, simply because they're too big. There's too many total number of atoms and electrons that make them up for our computers today to handle. Now, the implications of this limitation are huge. Right now, we're in a world where we always hear about ideas like. Person-specific drugs, or universal cures for aggressive cancers, or stopping viral epidemics, or trying to figure out the origins behind life itself. Now, current progress in all of these fields hinges upon trial and error. And as great as some of the computational abilities of bioinformatics and sequencing the genome have been, for these applications, conventional computers just won't cut it. So what we need is a leap forward. We need processors beyond anything we've seen before. We need a computing paradigm shift, equivalent to taking us from the horse and buggy all the way out to warp drive on the Starship Enterprise. <laughs> and this is it. This is a quantum processor. One of the cores of the quantum computing systems that my team is building, and this will drive the next generation of computing. Now, my whole entire life, I've wanted to understand how things work, and to make connections between physics and the real world. Now, we all know how important physics is for describing things around us, like how things fall, how the planets move, or how we light up and power our homes. But I never thought that something as esoteric and weird as quantum mechanics could be used to reveal how we, as living beings, work. And that inside this very package are tiny circuits that obey the laws of quantum mechanics and have the potential to unlock real chemistry and real biology. Now, the reason for this connection is actually quite profound. And we have to throw it back to 1982, when Nobel Prize-winning physicist Richard Feynman issued forth this revolutionary challenge: 
To paraphrase Feynman, he basically said, "You know, if we're going to try and simulate these naturally occurring molecules, well, it'd be silly to do that with these computers that just aren't built for that challenge. It's a wrong type of logic. Instead, we should use a different set of objects, which we have control over, and which follow those same exact laws of quantum mechanics." Now, there's that connection that I've been searching for, and that's how I want to apply physics to our real world. Now it's interesting at the end of this quote that Feynman says it doesn't look so easy, and that's certainly proven true over the last 20 plus years. Because you see, computing with quantum mechanics means dealing with information that is exquisitely delicate and fragile. With our regular computers, we process information as bits, as zeros and ones. It's just like setting a bunch of switches on and off, and when we set them, they stay where we want. But in quantum computing, Information isn't just binary. It can be zero, it can be one, or it can be in a superposition of zero and one at the same time. Now, I know that sounds weird, but welcome to the wacky world of quantum computing. So now we have all these additional options for the information. It can be zero, it can be one, it can be anywhere in between on the surface of this sphere. And we refer to this unit of information as a quantum bit or qubit. The challenge is that qubits are fickle little beasts, way trickier to simply set and forget the way we do with those switches in our regular computers. See, trying to preserve one of these funky superposition states in a qubit is a bit like trying to balance an egg at the end of a needle. Now, you certainly can do it, but any little disturbance from noise, from heat, from vibrations. And you suddenly got yourself a sunny side up. So what this all means is that there are three critical challenges for making real physical quantum computing systems. First, we actually have to have qubits that we can set the positions for. Second, once we've got them set, preserving them, keeping them right where we want. And third, bringing together many of these qubits all interconnected, so that we can start to process and calculate some of those difficult molecules. And in Feynman's day, this holy trinity of controllability, preservation, and scalability was simply impossible. And yet, I am standing in front of you here today because, over these years, the impossible is finally starting to become possible. Every year, more and more quantum computing teams throughout the world are making gigantic strides towards Feynman's dream. For example, in my lab, we are building real. Physical qubits. Well, actually, they're superconducting qubits, which just means that they're made out of materials that need to be really, really cold in order to work. The great thing about these qubits is that they run on simple electrical signals, giving us controllability. And second, by being really, really cold, that's how we get preservation. But now, when I say cold, I mean really, really cold. I mean like minus 459 degrees Fahrenheit. Or minus 273 for the Celsius-speaking world, but that's colder than outer space itself. And now we have to make our qubits precisely this cold to protect and preserve those delicate superposition states that give quantum computing its power. Now, 15 years ago was the first demonstration of this type of technology. At the time, the world was stunned, and it held quantum information for just a nanosecond. Now today we are building qubits that last for over 100,000 times longer, and we test them in these refrigeration systems that can essentially run for as long as we want. Those white cylinders are fridges which hold the qubits that we build. So now, with all this progress in controllability and preservation, we turn our attention to scalability. Early this year, we demonstrated this four-qubit processor. And it's actually the one that's in my pocket here. But the great thing about this four-qubit device is that the four qubits, which are the four squares in the middle, are arranged in a way that is scalable towards even larger numbers of qubits. This is a building block, and we've already taken the first step beyond, and are looking at this eight-qubit device right now as I speak. So now, already at this eight-qubit processor level, we can start to do some simple chemistry. Like looking at the bonding properties of a molecule like hydrogen, H2. 
But then, what about those more complicated molecules that we talked about, like caffeine or proteins and things like that? Well, not quite yet. But this is an important milestone to mark because, with a little more elbow grease, a heck of a lot more caffeine, to clear just a few more engineering hurdles, soon we will put together networks of 20 to 100 qubits in our processor. And when that happens, then we can take on some of these problems that surpass the capabilities of our current computers. The focus shifts from can we build this darn thing. To how do we use it? <laughs> And to me, this is the most exciting part about quantum computing. This is where we can take the discourse beyond physics and engage with fields like chemistry, like biology, with groups of people working on the most challenging and difficult problems in human health, in the natural environment. And just as conventional computers had revolutionized our world before us, so will quantum computers. When we bring together this powerful mindshare and reignite our collective scientific imagination, thank you.